Great, thank you, Ravi, for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me to start off the summer. Uh, I would like to share with you some uh, an arc of a circle of ideas I've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, mostly today, it will be about a lot of explicit geometry and interesting geometric phenomena uh, in positive characteristic that might feel, I mean, if from a perspective of um, a classical geometer over the complex numbers seem kind of strange, but uh, they are phenomena that do honestly happen quite systematically in positive characteristic. And uh, you, I, I think really to understand positive uh, characteristic geometry, one has to kind of develop systematically and think really hard about these uh, phenomena. So today we'll be focused on mainly the example of uh, cubic hypersurfaces, which is a class of hypersurfaces uh, in projective space in, in over fields of positive characteristic. So, okay, throughout, uh, uh, K will be an algebraically closed field of characteristic P, uh, where P is a positive prime, and Q is going to be a power of a uh, of our ground field characteristic P. So let me just tell you uh, right offhand what a cubic hypersurface is. They're uh, extremely familiar objects that have been studied classically, or well, at least by many people by now. So, uh, well, a uh, Oops, I want a slightly smaller size. A Q, big hypersurface, uh, hypersurface uh, let's say in projective n plus one space over our field K, or uh, slightly more briefly, a cubic n fold is a hypersurface of degree Q plus one. Okay, it can be quite large. Uh, given by an equation of the form, it's going to look like a sum of monomials of your coordinates of your projective space. Uh, some linear combination of monomials that look like a linear uh, term xi times a um, q power term xj. And this is a degree q plus one equation uh, in, your, in your projective space. And uh, a cubic hypersurface is nothing but a uh, hypersurface of this type. Okay, so immediately I should tell you some examples. Uh, the most famous, perhaps, uh, most well studied in some sense it, uh, example is the uh, Fermi hypersurface. Uh, this is given by equations, uh, the equation where you take just your uh, linear coordinates on your projective space, raise each to the q plus first power, and you sum them all up. If you, if you feel fancy, you can add a whole bunch of coefficients in front of them, but let's take the vanilla Fermat hypersurface in, in projective n plus one space. This is nice and smooth, and uh, this is the perhaps main example. Uh, next, let's look in a slightly lower dimension. Another uh, familiar example is perhaps the Hermitian curve. This is where you take, say, uh, three coordinates on P2, x0, x1, x2, and consider the equation x0 um, x1 to the q, say, uh, minus x0 uh, to the q, x1 uh, plus x2 to the q plus 1 equal to 0. Uh, this has an interesting property where you can see uh, immediately many points. For instance, all of the uh, fq points in the first two variables are part of this curve. And uh, this, this curve has been studied for its reasons like its automorphism group is extremely large. It has many uh, low degree points you know, over fq and fq squared and so forth. Um, and let me tell you one more example, which is um, also quite representative of the phenomena that we will look at. Uh, I like to call it the q-cuspidal curve and you will perhaps see why. It's given by equations x0, x1 to the q uh, minus x2 to the q plus one, say. Uh, you can uh, look and see that say for when q is equal to two, this is maybe the familiar cuspidal curve, uh, cusp curve that you know. And uh, I like to imagine that this is uh, visualized as a typical cusp as well. Uh, in, in, for higher q, it is still irreducible. It is still rational as one singular, uh, singular point. And I like to think of it as uh, looking at like that. Okay, so these are maybe the examples to keep in mind uh, as we go forth. So, to begin, <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about the classification of these cubic hypersurfaces. So the first thing to observe about uh, 
the equations of cubic hypersurfaces is that it turns out that they live all, well, they, they live in the vector space of degree Q plus one forms um, in your projective coordinates. But in fact, they're, they live in a very special linear subspace in that uh, big vector space. And this is the uh, linear subspace that you uh, get as follows. So, well, just looking at the form of the equations, you, uh, you see that these, uh, these equations, cube, uh, the, the um, equations of cubic hypersurfaces uh, arise as taking the product of a linear form, so in a section of O1 on Pn plus one, um, together with a Q power form, uh, which is a section of uh, a particular subspace of OQ. And you multiply those sections together and uh, you get a degree Q plus one equation. And this second space over here is, is a special phenomenon, a special thing that happens in an impulsive characteristic. That is, in, uh, if you look at the vector space of degree Q equations, there is a distinguished linear subspace. Let me repeat, linear subspace that's given by taking Q powers of uh, linear forms. Uh, so the fact that this is linear comes from our favorite freshman's dream. If you take um, two Q powers, X to the Q and Y to the Q, because uh, Q is a P power, their sum is also a, a Q power. X, plus, uh, X to the Q plus Y to the Q is X plus Y, all in parentheses, to the Q. So this is actually a linear subspace. Um, so to, to move forth, let me give some uh, things names. Let me say gamma O1 is um, the vector space V. And let me denote this uh, space of Q power forms viewed as a subspace of gamma of OQ as uh, V to the Q. And uh, with this notation, you can uh, quite uh, tip, uh, usually identify the space of Q plus one forms as the uh, Q plus first symmetric power of this vector space V. Okay, so uh, equations of cubic hypersurfaces, although degree Q plus one, live in some very interesting special linear subspace. And as, as such, uh, you, you see that a parameter space for cubics is given by simply the projective space you get by taking uh, this linear subspace. So this projective space of lines inside V tensor V to the Q parameterizes these cubic hypersurfaces. Now, if we meditate on what a point in uh, P V tensor V to the Q is, well, this is a line inside uh, V tensor V to the Q. I'm gonna use the convention of uh, projective spaces of lines. This uh, dually is going to be a linear form, a linear functional out of the dual spaces. So this is going to be a linear functional from uh, V dual tensor V to the Q dual down to K, this is linear. And one, oh, well, a linear form on a tensor, a tensor product of two spaces, uh, sort of the raison d'etre of a tensor product is, well, you should think of this as a uh, bilinear form or a bilinear pairing, perhaps, a bilinear pairing between uh, the space V dual and V to the Q dual. And so it sort of looks like a quadratic form almost, uh, but okay, with a, with a Q twist. But perhaps what this point of view I would like to uh, suggest from would be that a convenient way to label points of this parameter space to um, a convenient way to package the data of the equation of a cubic hypersurface is that you should uh, simply look at the, the matrix of coefficients capital A being the matrix. So you take an equation F is equal to sum AIJ of XI, XJ to the Q, just package the, the, um, the uh, coefficients into a N plus two by N plus two size matrix. And uh, 
one might think of this as a sort of gram matrix for the uh, for F or the bilinear form associated with F. So let me call this the gram matrix for F. Okay, and in a way, uh, these cubic hypersurfaces behave a lot like degree two hypersurfaces uh, or quadric hypersurfaces. And this is an observation that goes back very, very far, of course, but um, let's take this analogy extremely seriously and see where we go, uh, where we get, uh, get to. All right, okay, so we're talking about classification. So uh, let's think again about what we need to do to classify these. Uh, I would like to consider two cubic hypersurfaces which are related by uh, linear change of coordinates to be the same. So what I need to observe then is that if you look at the subspace V tensor V to the Q inside um, the degree, uh, degree Q plus one um, forms on V, that subspace, that linear subspace is stable under the natural uh, general linear group action that you get by just coordinate substitutions on V. So this, uh, well, this tells you that you ought to consider, um, ooh, perhaps moduli space or perhaps moduli stack of um, cubic hypersurfaces to be this projective space on uh, this V tensor V to the Q, our parameter space, modded out by, well, I've taken the projective space, so I pr probably should take the projective general linear group instead and um, look at the quotient of the projective space V on V tensor V to the Q by the projective general linear group. Okay, and to classify cubic hypersurfaces in some senses to describe some of the points of this, uh, this stack. Okay, and here uh, is a classification theorem. Let me tell you about it. So the stack cubic to the n turns out to be of dimension zero and it has finally many points which you can label quite conveniently with uh, partitions of size uh, at most n. So if you sum the parts of your partition, you get a number which is at most n plus one, sorry, n plus one, not n. Okay, and let me tell you what the correspondence is. So if you have a partition, say lambda, which has parts lambda one greater than or equal to lambda two, greater than or equal to say goes up to lambda m, and each of these are non-negative. Well, this goes to the uh, orbit of the cubic hypersurfaces with gram matrix, let me call it A sub lambda. And A sub lambda is going to be the matrix, the block diagonal matrix you get by taking um, the sum of a matrix J lambda one, sum direct sum uh, J lambda two, so forth until you get J lambda M. And then you tack on a few more, uh, a few more things on the diagonal, which are just ones. And uh, you just tack on enough to make this uh, a N plus one by, I'm sorry, N plus two by N plus two matrix. So N plus two uh, minus size of lambda. So actually, I guess the partitions are should be size uh, n plus two. There are many shifts of one here. Uh, I should tell you what the uh, j lambdas are. Here, I write j mu for the mu by mu matrix, which is zero basically everywhere except on the upper uh, super diagonal where you just have uh, a set of mu plus one ones. So this is maybe a Jordan block of size mu or a Neopolitan matrix of size mu. Uh, Why are there so many names attached to this? Yes, I, I was about to get to, let me, let me tell you about uh, some of the history, I guess, of this. So it turns out, yes. 
before that, can I ask, uh, what does partition of size less than equal to n plus two mean? Ah, yes, of course. So a partition is going to be a, 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 a list of numbers as, as here, a list of uh, non-negative integers such that, um, or I guess positive integers I hear I want, uh, such that uh, this, the sum of uh, the sum, which I write as absolute value of lambda, so lambda one, to lambda m, uh, this, this is uh, an integer that's at most n plus two. So it's all the ways that you can break n plus two or a number smaller into sums of, uh, of integers. Great. So there's no constraint on the m, just on the total size. Uh, pardon? No constraint on the? On the number of uh, parts? Just no, no constraints on the number of parts. No, yes, that's right. I mean, th there will be at most, uh, I guess, n plus two parts of ones, but Yes, no constraints on the parts otherwise. That's great. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Okay, uh, so let me tell you about uh, a bit of the history of this type of result. Um, as far as I know, okay, uh, this has been rediscovered in, in various uh, degrees of completeness over and over again. Uh, in uh, the, the furthest, reference I know would be the thesis of um, Hefez um, from 85. He, he discovered or you know, he classifies at least the smooth cubic ones and uh, shows that basically only the Fermat case appears. Uh, Beauville did the same in another paper where uh, he studies um, hypersurfaces with uh, constant hyperplane section moduli. So Hefez and uh, the smooth case has been known for um, a long time. Smooth case equivalently when the um, when the gram matrix has maximal rank. Uh, next, the next result I know is um, uh, Ho Huang in 2016 um, did the classification when the gram matrix had uh, co rank one, so uh, had one minus the maximal rank, uh, and. The result is basically of this form where you only have uh, these Jordan blocks. Uh, I, I found this result uh, in 2018, but has uh, lingered in my notes uh, for, for since then, when, as I've been thinking about extensions of, of things, as we will see. And uh, to my great delight, uh, another, another group of mathematicians uh, recently were very interested in this type of object as well. And uh, they are Kadizrova. Uh, Kenkel, Page, Singh, Smith, uh, Vrescu, and uh, Witt. So in, um, I guess, late 2020, they also uh, proved this classification theorem for uh, cubic forms as well. Uh, they, they do this under a different name, but it is exactly the same theorem in some sense. Um, their methods are slightly different and they use very explicit matrix methods and it's, it's, it's quite delightful. They also, uh, they also tell you that, or they also study cubic hypersurfaces from the point of view of um, F singularity theory. And it turns out that these uh, cubic hypersurfaces are special, not only for the reasons I will tell you below, but they are somehow extremal for a certain measure of um, F singularities. Okay, so uh, there, there's a lot there, but uh, this is uh, the classification theorem. Uh, further questions before I move on? Um, so this yes. matrix A lambda mm -hmm. yes. size two times n plus two or am I really is saying? size, pardon? What's the size of the matrix? Uh, n plus two by n plus two. So you have J lambda one, which is size lambda one and so on to J lambda m. So the total yes. size of the J's will be n plus two. And then you uh, I, I oh. then tack on um, a, a ones to fill it up into n plus two by, by n plus two. Okay. Does that make sense? Maybe, maybe in, in a moment, I will tell you sure. some examples that mm -hmm. it will make slightly more sense. Maybe okay. I've lost, maybe I've lost track of, I thought there were only n plus one variables or where did the n plus two come from in the grand matrix? Ah, right. I mean, I am working in a projective space of, of uh, dimension n plus one. So Got it. Okay. That, that's very confusing, right? <laughs> yes. And you had a reason for that, or I guess why? <laughs> so that it, so that the dimension of my hypersurface is the dimension n. Ah, okay. Yes. 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 You, you you always struggle with these off by ones when you want to, uh, when you want something to be dimension n. 
Okay. Sorry, could you tell me which one is that smooth? Ah, yes. So perfect. Great. Uh, so let me tell you the, the okay. examples. Yeah. So the, the first example is going to be the Fermat cubic hypersurface. And this is as, as above the equation where you take the, the, equa uh, the variables raised in the group plus one and sum them. And so by the, by the classification theorem, okay, an easy lemma is that a cubic is, is smooth if and only if the gram matrix has maximal, uh, has full rank. And so by the classification, you see that this is the unique smooth cubic hypersurface up to projective equivalence. Uh, which, you know, you can decide whether or not this is disappointing in that there aren't more smooth examples or kind of amazing that uh, th there's only one. Uh, but okay, the, the, the Fermat cubic is the, the unique smooth one. Okay, the next thing uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about are what cubic zero folds are. So these are hypersurface in uh, the projective line, uh, maybe quite Quite, quite simple, but let, let me tell you about them because they, the whole many things rest on understanding what cubic zero folds are. So if you look at the classification theorem, you'll see that there are three possible types, which are not the entire entirety of uh, P1. You can have the full rank gram matrix one plus one. So this corresponds to lambda equal to just the zero partition. Uh, the equation of this thing is going to be um, x to the zero to the q plus one plus x one to the q plus one. And uh, this indeed is just a set of distinct uh, q plus one distinct points. Okay, so the next uh, one would be when your partition is of, uh, when lambda is just the partition two. And in this case, you have x zero, uh, the equation of, uh, given by this gram matrix is x zero, x one to the q. And uh, well, what this is, is going to be a single point which has multiplicity one and together with a very uh, thick point of multiplicity q. Uh, in total, you have two physical points. And finally, the most degenerate one in some sense when uh, your lambda is just one. You have uh, the gram matrix, which is just one on the left uh, diagonal. And this has equation x zero to the q plus one. And you see that this is just an extremely thick point of multiplicity q plus one. Uh, and you get just a single point um, as uh, underlying, the underlying set only has a single point. Um, Maybe yes. this is not this is not intended to be a pedantic dumb question. Just to make Please. sure I understand. Uh, uh, so I see there are the partitions of zero, of one, and one of the partitions of two. So you have to get rid of the the other. You know, you're never allowed to have a version of n plus two that's all ones, or else you just get the zero gram matrix. Is that in my? Uh, that that is also the zero gram matrix. Yes, yes, that's the zero gram matrix, which is. And that's not supposed to count. So, uh, well, you know, you you can decide whether or not you want to consider it, uh, but yes. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay. Right. So look, looking at the geometric picture of what, what these are, you, you see that in fact, um, amongst these schemes, there, there, there are pretty uh, clear specialization relations between um, these cubics. Q plus one points can come eventually coalesce together and you can obtain just two points one with uh, high multiplicity and one just with multiplicity one, but two, uh, two points. And uh, these two points can then can further coalesce and you obtain a point of uh, multiplicity Q plus one. Um, and okay, I would like to think of this, this series of Q plus one, okay, two and one as reminiscent of another, ser uh, another set of integers, just I guess. The, the set of integers, three, two, one. And from here, I think um, I would like to, to try to convince you that a lot of the low degree geometry, at least, of these cubic hypersurface uh, surfaces uh, are quite analogous to the, the um, geometry of cubic hypersurfaces, hypersurfaces of degree three, even if you just think over C. Um, and well, hopefully this, this is the beginning of something that will convince you. 
But before we move on to uh, some, another example of that, I think is slightly more convincing. Let me tell you what cubic curves look like. Uh, so these are cubic hypersurfaces in P2. And um, I've drawn their, or written down their gram matrices and um, the corresponding equations here. So uh, let me briefly describe what they look like geometrically or what I like to think about them geometrically. So the first on the very left is going to be uh, the Fermat example. This is the smooth cubic curve. I like to think of it as a smooth curve, a smooth plane curve. The next example you will see is after a change of sign, the uh, cube cuspidal curve that um, I talked about to begin with. And I, I like to think of it, this as a, well, a curve, which looks like a cusp with a single singularity. Next is going to be an equation of the form x0, x1 to the q plus x1, x2 to the q. You see that you can factor out um, the, the variable x1. And it turns out that in fact, yes, this, this curve is, has two irreducible components. There's going to be a line corresponding to x1 equal to zero. And the remaining, the remaining component is um, in a irreducible curve. And it turns out to have a single singularity that uh, corresponds to its intersection with this line. And they only intersect at this singular point. So it's sort of a slightly less cuspy curve union a line. The next example will be uh, the, represented by a matrix with just two ones on the diagonal. And uh, this is a cone over the uh, Q plus one lines, or sorry, points from P1. And so this is just Q plus one lines inside, um, inside P2 that is over a cone point. And the next example is going to be a sum of uh, the, the two by two no potent matrix and the zero matrix. And uh, this is equation x zero, x one to the Q. And I like to think of this as, well, it is a union of two lines, one with multiplicity one and one with multiplicity Q. And finally, uh, eventually the uh, vertical line collapses onto the horizontal line and you get a very degenerate uh, cubic curve where you have just a single line of multiplicity Q plus one. Okay. Um, can I ask yes. if you only get a linear order on the partitions? Is that yeah. uh, Well, there's a linear order that you see now on, uh, on these things. And um, there is indeed a, this, this reflects the closure relations inside the, the moduli um, stack that parameterizes these things. Uh, unfortunately, with the labeling convention so far, it doesn't quite mesh with, the, with any nice order that I can see on, the, on partitions. But, mm -hmm. uh, well, there, there are certain closure relations, and it, it is at least a linear. Is always linear or can it be not linear? A part of it? Can, it, can the, the relation be not linear sometimes? Would it happen that you have? For a long time, I just uh, start of the same dimension. Right. Uh, uh, I, I'm not completely sure. For a long time, I thought maybe it would not be linear. I've not worked mm -hmm. this out completely, but it seems to me that actually it does look like it's going to be linear always. But OK, uh, I, I've not worked this out completely yet. So I, I cannot answer you surely. But I think even in the, if we go one dimension higher, it still is linear. That, that much I can tell you. Oh, so this question, I'm kind of sure, I'm, I'm multiply surprised. One that it's, I would have thought, I would have hoped or expected to be obviously, is the question, is it always ordered by closure or not? And, the, and you said it's, you, it might be all, is that, is yes. that the meaning? And so it, I would have assumed, I was, you were gonna say, well, definitely once sun gets big, it's not gonna be partially, it's, it's not gonna be. No, I agree. Uh, right. That's what I thought for a long time, but it, it seems yeah. otherwise, but okay. And is yeah, it not can't you argue just? Can't you argue just based on the number? Because the, I mean, the number of partitions is growing faster than polynomially, but uh, okay. the maximum co-dimension is 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 of order n squared, right? Uh -huh. Ah, I see. Interesting. Yes, good point. So I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not quite sure yet. I yeah, think maybe... that seems like that seems like a proof that it can't be totally ordered. Yes, you can't uh, have. I no, I agree. The same. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
That's very nice. Okay. Um, hmm. Yes, I'm not sure yet. So uh, that, 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 we'll, we'll see perhaps. Okay. Um, so, right, let's, let's use this. I would like to explain this old observation. One of the reasons that um, cubic hypersurfaces, at least the smooth ones gained attention a long time ago is the following observation due to um, Shiota. The, that a smooth cubic hypersurface of dimension at least two is, turns out to be purely and separably unirational. So that means that there is a uh, dominant map from some, uh, some projective space, which uh, is purely inseparable. Uh, I, I would like to quickly explain this construction. Um, and for the, for the sketch, let me just deal with the case where dimension X is two uh, of our hypersurfaces is two so that I can draw pictures. And the general case is extremely similar. So, so did you already say that the smooth cubics are all for Mars anyway? And that's the, and, and hence there's only one case to check? Uh, or, yes. No, uh, or you don't want to use that though? Uh, I that. will not use that. You can decide whether or not it's used, uh, but uh, I will draw pictures and you can decide. So let, let, let me, okay, let's consider our uh, our X. This is a surface inside P3. So this is our X. Okay, so one thing you can uh, check, um, either is explicitly using the equations or otherwise, uh, we'll say below, um, that inside X, you can find a line L. So this is a line. So fix one choice of line. Okay. And now I would like you to consider projection away from this um, choice of line L. So this, this map, this rational map from P3 to P1 is a projection away from L. Okay, let's, let's imagine our P1. Let's now take a general point inside P1. And I would like to consider the fiber of the map uh, well, projection of X down to P1. So you restrict the projection to X and let's, let's imagine what you have. Okay, so the most geometric way to imagine fiber is to choose another P1 inside P3, which is, uh, which is disjoint from this orange L we've chosen. And then now if given a point as this green point on our P1, we live inside of P3. If you take the span of, um, of the point, this green point, and um, your orange line that you fixed, you will obtain a P2 inside this P3. So this is a P2 that's obtained by taking the span of uh, your fixed point, this general point on our P1 and our fixed line L. And what we know is that this will intersect X uh, at L certainly. And moreover, what we know is that the intersection of X with um, this P2 will be a cubic curve. If you think about the, the form of the equation of um, a cubic hypersurface, you see that if you uh, restrict to any hyperplane, you will still get a cubic equation under the, the smaller dimensional uh, projective space. So this tells us that we have a cubic curve which contains a line. So it certainly has to be um, one of these cubic curves um, in, in uh, here. Um, the next fact that I'm going to tell you is that actually X only has finitely many lines. So since you, there are infinitely many uh, or, uh, green points you can choose, the general member can't be this, uh, the, the union of Q plus one lines. And so the general member must be this, uh, this cubic curve, which is a line union and cuspidal curve. So you see that for a general point uh, on our P1, the fiber of, of the projection is going to be um, this, the line union, uh, this cuspidal curve in red. Okay. But now what does this mean? This means that, okay, so consider our X. Let's resolve this projection by blowing up X along uh, this, this uh, this line, and uh, this gives us a map down to P1. 
And what we found is that the general fiber of this map from X tilde down to P1 is, is this red cuspidal curve that you, you see. Now, the, the single calculation that you now have to do, or you can convince yourself otherwise, is that there's this distinguished point, this singular point on this red curve, the intersection between the red curve and the line. And the coordinates of that point can be expressed um, in terms uh, of this map X tilde down to P1. Uh, well, you can, you can, find, you can express this, um, co the coordinate of the, this pink intersection point um, so as long as you can take a Qth root of the, um, of the coordinate of the P1 down uh, of this vibration. Um, put differently, this means that if you adjoin a Qth root of, uh, of the, the coordinates of the P1 downstairs, in other words, you pull back by the absolute Frobenius, the X tilde prime that you get is going to emit a birational map from um, this, this P1 downstairs together with uh, this uh, product, this uh, red cuspidal curve here. And now if you normalize the surface, you get a P1 and this is a cuspidal curve and it's normalized by a P1 and this composition from P1 cross P1 down all the way down to X is your unirational parameter two a unirational parameterization of degree Q. And you see that is also purely inseparable. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a, a one geometric way of seeing why the smooth cubic hypersurface is always um, unirational. And perhaps this reminds you of one way of make, uh, showing that degree three hypersurfaces are also unirational. You do the same thing, you project from the line and you see that the general fiber is gonna be iconic and up to adjoining a square root of the fibration, uh, the, the base coordinates, you can, you can find a section and split um, your fibration. Okay, questions? Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna betray my naivety and characteristic P, but does Please. this mean that X is rational? Like, no, it like is not. If, okay. It, it, but it if it was a complex, like in the complex yeah. scenario, it would be. Yes. I mean, yeah, okay. For the surface of this, yes. Uh, but no, not, not here because there, there's some degree. And in fact, the point is that, for instance, if we just think about the surface, right? X as a degree Q plus one surface in, in P3 and for Q bigger than two. So when Q plus one is bigger than three, well, the, the canonical bundle is, is ample. So there's no way it could have been uh, rational to, at all. Uh, so yeah, and this is quite different indeed. But also what is kind of really strange is that you have a um, surface for instance of general type, which is unirational. And this is something that can, is definitely not possible in, uh, in over the complex numbers. Okay. Okay, I, I hope this is slowly trying to, uh, looking like X might be reminiscent of um, a degree three hypersurface. It, 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 this, this argument may remind one of uh, such constructions for uh, degree three hypersurfaces. But um, I think what really uh, convinces me at least that you should take this analogy kind of seriously is in studying uh, further the linear geometry of cubics. That is to say, studying the lines and linear spaces in these cubic hypersurfaces. Um, so to describe this, let me just fix a smooth cubic n-fold. So this is hypersurface and projective n plus one space. And let me denote by f sub r of x to be the uh, final scheme of lines, or sorry, final scheme uh, project, uh, parameterizing uh, P, uh, R dimensional projective spaces that you find inside X. This is a sub Yes. Okay. 
this is a sub variety of the um, Grassmannian of R plus one planes in the underlying n plus two dimensional vector space. Um, and uh, let me tell you something about these FRs in general. One uh, uh, sort of um, maybe surprising at first glance fact is that FR of X is always smooth and has a particular dimension and just a dimension that is quite large. In particular, it does not depend on Q. So it is FR of X is a smooth of dimension um, R plus one, uh, N plus two minus two R plus one. Um, and okay, so uh, maybe you want, one should say it's empty if this is negative. And what about what rather than lines, but of other like planes and uh... yes, R can be anything. So indeed, if you take uh, okay. R is good. It's yes. always for any of them. It's always smooth or empty. It's always smooth of this particular dimension. Yes. Okay, and, the, and this dimension is the expected dimension in some sense. Uh, least... Depends on what you mean, right? The, the part of the subtlety Pardon. is that. Yeah, maybe what, what I mean is. Uh... Ah, okay, yes. I don't because know the point is this, okay, to, to, okay, maybe if I should say, tell you the first example, right? The first case where this is a non-zero number is when uh, N is two. So uh, again, we have a cubic surface inside P3. And um, if you work out what this formula is when uh, for this set of lines, uh, this, this will give you a zero dimensional uh, scheme of lines. And uh, I guess part of the, what this tells you is that there's a smooth, so this consists of a set of reduced points. And in fact, uh, you, can, you can count and it ends up being Q plus one, uh, Q cubed plus one points. Okay, so it depends on what you mean by expected dimension, right? Uh, for X is uh, degree uh, Q plus one. So if you're over the complex numbers, okay, take Q is equal to two. So here's a thought bubble. When Q is equal to two, uh, Q plus one, or all of our hypersurfaces are degree three. And um, you, you do expect over the complex numbers that you know a cubic hypersurface, or perhaps rather I should say, you know and love that a cubic surface over the complex numbers has exactly, or a smooth one has exactly 27 lines. And uh, this is indeed this number two plus one, uh, two to the eight, uh, three plus one. But now over the complex numbers, if you take degree to be uh, of X to be any higher, you generally expect there not to be any lines at all. And one of the kind of curious facts about cubics is that they always have many more uh, lines or linear spaces than you expect. And in fact, they do so systematically independently of, uh, or in, in a way that only sort of depends on dimension rather than anything else. So, okay, let me ask, uh, please see if I can set this question up. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's gonna seem maybe unmotivated, but based on some things that I randomly talked about with Isabel Vogt. Uh, so if you, so if you, if you had a per pencil of Fermat's yes. over, P, uh, over P1, sure. well, they're gonna get singular because yes. it's random, uh, right? Because you take a, uh, if they're actual Fermat's, but the advantage of these crazy things of these, okay. uh, uh, sorry, cubics, uh, is, is that you can have a P1 inside this parameter space of, of uh, your ground matrices. You okay. can take a, a, a P1 in there that's that right. is full, that's full, that's Generic, your matrix right. stays full rank. Oh, okay. no, it's still gonna get, ah, okay. Okay, I take it, I, uh, uh, let, me, let me take it back. Okay. In, 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 but let me pause with a quote question from Martin. Let me, Rescue that with a question from Arnav on this board, <laughs> which is uh, about the monitor reaction in the case where, uh, 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 which is there a story like the right. Right. six? I don't, uh, I thought about this briefly, and I think what happens is that um, sort of the monitor group ends up being the full automorphism group of the surface. This is some huge um, group, it's uh, some special unitary group, like finite special unitary group or something. Um, and it, it looked from uh, uh, from thinking about this briefly that the entire uh, the monodromy group should be the entire thing. But okay, uh, I'm I'm not too uh, uh, 
confident yet about that. So, uh, but yes, there is absolutely a story and it has, it is kind of fun. Okay, uh, further questions before I talk about the second case, which I really like. Okay, maybe I'll talk about the second case and you can interrupt me as, as we go along. So the second case is when, uh, when, when this formula is positive is when n is equal to three and r equal to one. In this case, now you have a um, three dimensional cubic, so a cubic three fold. And uh, what this formula says, if you quickly stare at it, is that now this scheme of lines is a, uh, is a smooth surface. So it has a dimension two and it is a surface. Uh, so let me call this surface of lines S and uh, let me tell you some things about uh, that I know about the surface S. Okay. So the surface S of lines on, um, on a cubic hyper, uh, sorry, threefold is a smooth projective surface. Okay, where you, the smoothness is um, above. But um, in particular, it is always of general type. Okay. And in fact, let me tell you what its canonical bundle is. In fact, the canonical bundle omega s is isomorphic to um, OS of um, 2q minus 3. Here, OS of 1 is the restriction of the Plucker line bundle from this cross Mannion. Um, so it is. Uh, it gets quite ample when, as, you, as Q uh, gets large. So if uh, Q is strictly bigger than two, it turns out that these S, um, well, S does not lift to uh, characteristic C zero, but even worse, it doesn't even lift to the second VIT vectors of our underlying field, okay? So in some sense, this is very, very much a characteristic P object. So does it violate the Bogomol of Yao inequality? You're spoiling this punchline, Ravi. Um, <laughs> effectively, yes. That, but uh, of course, to say that you need to, uh, to say that it doesn't lift to W2, uh, you need something finer. And I'll, I'll say that um, in a moment. OK, uh, so the next thing that I I, I very much in, enjoy is the following. So there are two, you can, you can form um, a set of uh, a bunch of abelian varieties associated with objects here. So first S is a surface, you can form its albanese. It's, it's, well, you can always do it, but in particular for S as being a surface, you can, you can do it. Um, and for, uh, for X, you can formulate, uh, you can associate something that looks like an intermediate Jacobian associated with the um, threefold X. This somehow parameterizes uh, one, algebraically trivial one cycles on X. And um, this is the fact that it is somehow rep the, the set of algebraically one cycles, or sorry, set of algebraically trivial one cycles um, is, is in some sense represented by a abelian variety is some old fact due to say mirror and, and others. So these two um, abelian varieties there's a natural map from the uh, Albanese to the, the intermediate Jacobian. And um, what I can prove so far is that this is an isogeny. In fact, I can show that it's only, a, it's, it's a P isogeny. So up to um, P phenomenon, and they're pretty close. And uh, moreover, both of these, um, so, okay, the, these abelian varieties are isogenous and uh, both of these abelian varieties are further isogenous to uh, something quite special, it is going to be an abelian variety that you can get by taking just um, a Q squared plus one power or Q squared plus one product of Jacobians of a curve. And this C is a smooth cubic curve. Okay. Um, all right, and, the, and let me tell you um, two more statements. Uh, okay, from this you can deduce, for instance, that S is super singular um, in whatever sense you like this word to mean um, and uh, satisfies the Tate conjecture. So this means that it's uh, 
on site. Uh, by this, I mean that um, it's Ital H2. If you look at the space span by the image of, um, of the images of uh, classes of curves, that's everything. So it's both Shioda and Artin, super singular. Yeah, it's excellent. Okay, that, that, has, also, that has a technical meaning, sorry. Sorry, go on. Do, do you also know if it's, um, if it's unirational? Yes, it is absolutely not unirational. In fact, it embeds, or basically embeds into its Albanese. And so oh, it's right. yeah, no rational curves yeah. at all. Right. Oh yeah, it's, it's also minimal, so yes. And it, it has an Albanese, so it, yeah. Oh, a very big Albanese at that, yes. Okay, and well, I'm telling you about a surface and I think you know one can't study a surface and not try to compute some invariance. So let me tell you uh, that uh, some invariance at least. Um, so the half of the Atal, uh, first Atal Betty number is going to be um, this a particular number, Q squared plus one, uh, Q choose two. And uh, Okay, I, would, uh, I can also tell you that this number is also um, H1 of the structure sheaf of the surface uh, with the caveat that I only know that how to prove this if uh, Q is equal to P is prime. So at least in, in that case, uh, I can tell you basically all the invariants um, it's Betty number is, or first Betty number is um, Q squared plus one um, times Q choose two times two. And half of that is going to be uh, the first coherent cohomology or the, the dimension of the first coherent cohomology. Okay. Um, so I am running out of time. So let me uh, give you a brief indications of the proof, but I am going to um, cheat and pull up some other slides that are mostly complete so that I do not have to write and I can just point at things now. Um, okay, let's see. So we were here. Um, right, okay. So let me tell you a slight indication on how the proofs go. For the first two sta statements, uh, to compute the, the canonical bundle and to show that um, S doesn't lift, uh, well, you take this analogy that um, the surface or the, the, the hypersurface is, is sort of like a quadric. And so the surface is sort of like an orthogonal Grassmannian of sorts. And from that, you can, you can show that the tangent bundle of your surface is something that looks kind of like a, the tangent bundle of an uh, orthogonal Grassmannian. Okay, what, what can you do to perturb a uh, iso isotropic line in, 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 a, in a space? Well, you can take your line and you can perturb it in an isotropic direction. And okay, as long as your isotropic direction isn't the same as your original line, you get something new. Uh, you do a computation, and this is going to be um, the, um, uh, the the following quanti uh, quantity. It's going to be S here is the universal uh, sub bundle on your Grassmannian. Um, so S dual tensor OS of one minus Q is uh, going to be what this ends up being. Uh, you use the fact that S is a uh, rank two thing. And so the wedge product pairing gives you isomorphism between um, S dual and S up to a twist. Um, and what you conclude from that is that um, the cotangent bundle is going to be S dual tensor, this ample thing, OS Q minus two. And now S dual has some sections. So definitely you can find an, an inclusion of OS of Q minus two inside the cotangent bundle and uh, once, because that thing is ample, uh, once Q is at, uh, strictly bigger than two, uh, you use some work of um, Langer on the Bogolov Mioka Yao inequality to deduce that this actually does not lift to W2. Okay. Um, for the. So, question yes. does, does this also say something about lifting to characteristic zero over possibly ramified extensions? Um, I'm not sure yet. I thought about that briefly, but I don't. Okay, it definitely says that you can't lift all the way to characteristic zero, even over ramified um, extensions. But I don't know about whether or not you can do so for, um, you know, intermediate uh, mixed characteristic rings. Well, I mean, yeah, if you have a ramified extension, then an intermediate thing could just look like FQ epsilon modulo some power of epsilon, right? So, okay, you can I mean, lift it. Depends it on what you mean, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. 
and, and, and then can um, the fact that you can't lift to W two? Can you like also get some? You feel like the Hodge theory of this that looks weird. Like, I don't, um, uh, like the Froelicher, the fact of the non <laughs> is, is the right. Uh, I think probably that's the case, but uh, I, at least. I don't know. I mean, if you could say that, then that would be another way of saying that this does not lift to W two. But uh, I don't, don't don't know a precise phenomenon of that nature quite yet. But you might be able to compute all that the, the Hodge diamond uh, of all of these guys because you I, have I think I have most of it now. But I don't know if I can get all of the Hodge diamond. Right. Cool. Right. But is the Hodge diamond looking weird yet, or so far it looks normal? So far it looks normal, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Cool. Great. Okay, so three and four, uh, one looks at the, the tautological incidence correspondence and you, you study uh, pulling and pushing. What, what's kind of amusing that um, I'm gonna briefly remark on is that it turns out that there's some surface inside X, which is a, sort of a complete intersection of X and a, a Q cubed big hypersurface. And basically this, this surface, um, there's a rational purely inseparable map from this Z to, um, to, to S and that they're, they're almost the same. And so you can use this uh, because it's a homeomorphism in the topology to, to do a lot. Okay, uh, and for, for the invariance, let me briefly give you a taste as to what, what these look like because it, it turns out to be the most intricate by far and kind of the most fascinating to me. It has been a long time, it was a frustration for a long time. Uh, and it was only recently that I, I could resolve this. So the Betty numbers, uh, what I could get um, the lean loose theory using the fact that these are extremely symmetric for finite unitary groups. And for the coherent cohomology, kind of strangely, I, I, I get this from a degeneration argument. I put the hypersurface in a family um, so that the singular, the, the, the central fiber is kind of singular with, uh, with a conic singularity. You can think of this as an analog of a nodal cubic hypersurface, perhaps. Um, this kind of tells you, uh, tells you that the um, corresponding scheme of lines ends up being much simpler. It, it is singular, it is not normal, but its normalization ends up being a projective bundle over a smooth cubic curve. So this sort of uh, reduces you, uh, reduces down the problem to um, computing cohomology of, um, of a, a, sh a sheaf script T that you get by taking the quotient of the push forward of the normalization by the structure sheaf of um, the surface, the singular surface. Um, so this is supported on um, a, 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 cur a curve that is basically the section infinity of T and um, I guess one of the key points of this degeneration is that there's a GM action throughout. And um, this allows you to identify this T as a graded sheaf. And in fact, because it is only supported on a formal, uh, on basically a, a formal neighborhood of a section, you can reduce it down to a computation on the curve C. And the main task is to compute um, the, the uh, H0 of just the graded pieces. And, uh, this, this is sort of the result that you get when you take all of these graded pieces and uh, arrange the individual numbers in a huge table. Um, and I, I think I will, well, let me, let me leave it here for, for a moment and you can observe patterns yourself. It turns out that uh, the patterns you observe are because that the, the underlying spaces end up being um, irreducible representations for the automorphism group of the curve. And there's some sort of symmetry that moves, every, shifts everything upwards and leftwards that, um, uh, well, allows you, uh, that creates this remarkable sym symmetry. In any case, the conclusion is that the um, H1 of the singular surface is basically what you want. It's P squared plus one times P choose two, plus something else though, uh, the quantity P, uh, P choose three. And uh, so if you use semi upper semi-continuity in the theory of the card schemes, you get a bunch of inequalities uh, that sandwiches H1 of OS. It's not quite what you want because you, you your upper bound is a bit too big. And so your task is to just eliminate those, uh, those final things. And here you use um, your GM action once again um, in, in the family. And you use the dictionary between GM equivariant sheaves on the A1 and uh, filtered things on, on uh, and filtered vector spaces effectively. 
um, okay, so let, let me say that then you can identify very specific classes which don't lift and it turns out to be classes um, that uh, are here. So there are a series of P, choose, uh, P minus two classes um, on the side, which you can always identify to not lift because a certain um, sequence does not split when, when you look at the family. And uh, that turns out to be exactly P choose three um, classes. And th this is uh, from that you conclude. Okay, I, I'm over time. And so I shall stop here. Uh, here are some maybe questions to ponder, uh, but otherwise, thanks very much. Great.